Hey there, everybody. It's Aaron Schatz from Football Outsiders, and I would like to welcome you to week two of the Off the Charts football podcast for the 2017 season. I am here with Matt Manicharian of Sports Info Solutions off his hot, hot, hot Off the Charts podcast debut last week. Matt, how do you feel about the debut last week? I feel like I came in somewhere between Rex Ryan and Tony Romo on the debut scale, so I'll take it. I'm trying to figure out, did we predict things as well as Romo did? I've never predicted anything as well as Romo did. All right, then I think we may want to put you in the Beth Mowens category of quality, but not psychic. (laughs) I'll take it. It's National Jump to Conclusions Week, of course, as always after week one of the NFL season, so it is overreaction time. We have one week of DVOA and one week of charting data, which is not enough to decide anything. And so let's talk about it anyway. Yes. Jump to conclusions, please. Let's talk about the game that had the most people shaking their heads, including, and I can tell you all because I was there, the entire press box at Gillette Stadium, Patriots versus Chiefs. Did you guys pick up some good stuff on the charting of that game that uh, is of interest? So one thing that came through that was pretty interesting was... The Patriots, when they were in zone coverage, the Chiefs had a lot of success against them. So we saw the Patriots really split between running a lot of man and a lot of zone throughout the game. But on those zone coverage plays, the Chiefs were 12 for 13 for 188 yards and a touchdown. No picks and no sacks. So the Patriots were having to rush five to get pressure. All three of their sacks came on actually 15 snaps out of cover one. That's a man coverage scheme with a single high safety over the top. So they started rushing a little bit more because they were having some struggles in terms of playing in the zone. But when they started coming more, they also gave up three touchdowns. So out of those 15 snaps in cover one, three sacks, but also three touchdowns for the Patriots. So we'll have to see how their coverage schemes develop throughout the year. I think it's interesting because in some ways the Chiefs were sort of a perfect offense to go against the Patriots because the Patriots have now built a defense where the strength, other than Hightower, The strength is the outside cornerbacks. And you don't need to go against outside cornerbacks if you're the Chiefs. What, do you throw into Chris Conley and Albert Wilson all game? Probably not. So, yeah, I mean, if the Patriots were playing zone, they were getting out of what they do best. Now, of course, what the Patriots try to do is do everything well, and a defense that has to play a certain kind of coverage is not what the Patriots want to do. They want to do everything well. But it does kind of make sense with their personnel that – that zone coverage is a bigger problem for them than man coverage. Right. Well, we saw that they couldn't they couldn't generate a pass rush while they were sitting back in zone, and and I think that's where they got a little bit of antsy. You know, you're giving up 12 out of 13 pass completions. I, I would get a little bit antsy also. So you can right. see why they came out of it. Yeah. The other problem, of course, is when Dante Hightower went out, is that there's a lack of linebacker depth. So Cassius Marsh, who they just picked up from Seattle, is really a defensive lineman. In fact. I always thought of him as a little bit more of a defensive tackle than a defensive end. He's the kind of guy who plays, uh, you know, you put, you move to defensive tackle on third and long, you know, that kind of defensive end. He's a big guy. All of a sudden, he's in man coverage as a linebacker on Kareem Hunt. That was a bad decision and led to an amazingly good play for the Chiefs and another big touchdown. And watching Kareem Hunt do what he did, I mean, the Patriots had a really strong run defense last year, like fifth in the league. But they were 22nd in DVOA against running back as receivers, and even worse if Cassius Marsh is going to be covered receivers on a regular basis. Absolutely. And Cassius Marsh is a guy that I actually did a cross-check report on when he was coming out of college. And, I mean, I'll tell you, he's one of the weirdest players I've ever watched because I wasn't sure if he was a defensive tackle, a defensive end, or an outside backer coming out. And as you've seen, he's played all of those positions in the NFL. I thought he was a great fit in Seattle because they have that kind of personality to their defense where they bring out the the great things that individuals do. I'll be curious to see if Cassius Marsh can find a a fit that well with another team. Another guy that you mentioned was Kareem Hunt. And to put his debut into context, he had five carries for 82 yards outside the tackles. Another interesting tidbit, all of his broken tackles came on zone blocking plays that the that the Chiefs ran. So they were running inside zone, outside zone, stretch zone, and all of his broken tackles came on those plays. So we're seeing Kareem Hunt, who was one of our strongest charting running backs that we watched last year at Toledo in terms of broken tackles. And now we see that when he was able to get into the zone scheme um, and able to see things set up in front of him a little bit, he's slippery and tough to bring down. 
Yeah, Hunt did poor in our back cast projection system, but of course, what is the most important aspect of a running back's game that back cast does not include broken tackles and elusiveness? Maybe in the future it'll it'll include that. I am hoping so. The other big shock, I think, coming out of week one is the fact that the Los Angeles Rams are number one in DVOA after a week. Now, of course, that's only one game, and we haven't incorporated opponent adjustments yet, and the Colts were not only with awful quarterbacking, but without their best defensive player in Vontae Davis. And the 49ers were number one after week one last year. So, you know, it's not a guarantee of future success. The Colts might but, have also been missing another guy on their team, too. Well, yeah, that's the thing. We all know about the quarterback they're missing. But I think fewer people realize that the lack of Vontae Davis may have contributed to Jared Goff looking like he was an actual professional quarterback in that game. Uh, yeah. In Dave, which is the stat we do, which incorporates week one with the preseason projection, we actually have Pittsburgh as number one. It is a little interesting that Pittsburgh, despite a close game with Cleveland, actually came out with a pretty good rating for the week. Something about sort of the way that they worked on you know, certain down and distances, they ended up with a, a quality rating. Of course, that rating will also drop once we incorporate the opponent adjustments. Right. And one thing that I saw you wrote on the site before the Rams get too excited, which team was it that was number one in DVOA after week one last year? Yes, that was San Francisco, the San Francisco 49ers. Who went on to light the world on fire. By which you mean light themselves on fire, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Interesting tidbit on Vontae Davis. For all of the Colts' issues in coverage last year, Vontae Davis was actually number eight in the league in uh, man coverage when he was the primary defender last year. He had the eighth best completion percentage against. So you're absolutely right there. Vontae Davis still has a lot of talent. Now, did you pick up anything on the Rams doing something differently on offense based on charting stats compared to what they did? I mean, obviously, they were doing very different things because Sean McVay burned the old playbook and started over. Right, and it seems to be a wise de decision. I can't tell you so much right now. I haven't been able to dive in really deeply on what they were doing specifically, but what I can tell you is that Goff was 70% on throws that traveled more than 10 yards down the field on Sunday. Last year, he was 33% on those throws over the course of the season. 33% on throws that traveled more than 10 yards downfield. That's a 46.1 rating he had on those. So you can see why people were so down on Goff coming into the year. But if he can continue that kind of success when he throws the ball down the field, we might be onto something here. Hopefully the uh, whole world has now come to football outsiders' opinion that the Rams uh, might be serious wildcard contenders. Unfortunately, another team from that division we thought was going to be wildcard contenders probably won't be now, and that's the Arizona Cardinals because they just lost their best offensive player for most of the season, David Johnson. And it's just really terribly depressing, not only for people who had him in fantasy football, but because you don't like to see a player with so much talent go down, it means you don't get to watch him for the next three months. Yeah, it's a, it's a sad, uh, sad loss, obviously. And unfortunately, we all talk about how injuries affect our fantasy team, but he is a person who's dealing with, with an injury right now. That said, the implications of the injury that I'm interested in discussing are not the fantasy implications, but the reality football implications of this injury. And the Cardinals are going to have to replace their most important part of their offense, and it seems like they're going to do it by committee a little bit. Um, they've re-signed Chris Johnson, and Kerwin Williams and Andre Ellington are also in the mix back there. We, you know, we loved Andre Ellington early on. He was number one in our top prospects list one year, but he's never quite developed off of what he did his rookie year. But uh, he can be used more with David Johnson's as a receiver. He fits that role better, whereas Kerwin Williams is more a runner. You know, I tend to be a big believer in the idea that running backs are mostly fungible. But there are two talents that I think set running backs aside uh, and make them less replaceable. One is breaking tackles, but the other is receiving value. Because one of the biggest reasons that running backs are fairly replaceable is that passing is so much more important than running. Well, if the running back is really good in the passing game, he's not as replaceable, is he? And very few running backs are as good in the passing game as David Johnson. And so, you know, they might find a running back who can give them 85% of what David Johnson can on the ground. But I don't think they can find anybody who can give them 70% of what David Johnson gives them as a receiver. Absolutely. 
And I'm going to disagree with you just a little bit because I'm going to come with some information that you're probably not privy to. Kerwin Williams, while he has been much more of a runner than a receiver since he's entered the league, I actually had the pleasure of doing a cross-check report on him when he was coming out of college in 2013. And I pulled that up from my old archives. And what I saw in there was that this was a player who I was with the Saints at the time, and I actually saw him as more of a fit as a replacement for Sproles than any of our feature backs at the time. So, and, and he did, he lined up even as a receiver sometimes. Um, I said he was a quicker than fast player, great acceleration, great vision and patience as a runner. Um, he can break arm tackles, but he's not an inside runner, not ideally suited to be an every down back. And you see the limitations in pass protection, which I think are going to have as much of an impact on his inability to play on passing downs than a perceived lack of hands or anything like that. It's really the ability to be trusted in protection that I think will determine whether or not he can stay on the field um, to take on more of that David Johnson role. Well, I stand corrected. But of course, that was a couple of years ago. And one of the things they really do try to do with guys once they get to the NFL is improve the pass protection, because that's often something that guys are really lacking when they come out of college. So if he has gotten better on that, then uh, then that's probably a good thing for the Cardinals. But maybe Chris Johnson will be the first and second down guy and Kerwin Williams will be the third guy more and Andre Ellington will be more of a change of pace. And I think, to be honest, I don't think Bruce Arian knows how it's going to go. I think sometimes with running backs, you gotta you got to put them back there and you got to see what works and you got to roll with it. And right. there's a nice, thorough, analytic answer for you. It's also got to fit the game script. You know, the same thing goes for, you know, any other team that has multiple running backs. Even with the Oakland Raiders, right, you know, they love their Marshawn Lynch, but if they fall behind in a game, which they didn't do in week one, they may go with more like Washington or Richard or guys who are more, you know, fall behind run pass, uh, pass routes. Right, they'll be in on with the 11 personnel guys where you're not going to see Marshawn as much. So speaking How do you of, feel about Marshawn in week one? Yeah. Yeah, we talked about Marshawn last week and we explored whether or not that fit in Oakland behind a little bit more of a power inside running O-line was going to be a good fit for him. And he looked great. Uh, 14 carries for 61 yards in between the tackles and 50 of those 61 yards came after contact. They ran him almost exclusively on zone runs and mostly to the off-tackle holes. So what does that mean? That means they're not pulling guards. They're, they're not running the traditional, what you call the power offense, but they're, they're running inside zone, outside zone plays with him, and that often sets up the play-action game very well. Interesting, interesting. How about the defense for the Oakland Raiders? Obviously did a nice, strong job. Against the Titans, although, I mean, mostly this game was offense versus offense. But what did you notice about the Oakland defense in this game? So one thing that we noticed from the Oakland defense is that where they were mostly a pure man team last year, they came and they, they sprinkled in about 50-50 zone in this game on non-screen passes. So that'll be something to keep an eye on in the future as they, made, they seem to have made a scheme change or maybe it was just a, a one-week aberration. I wonder if that uh, is somewhat the decision to replace Sean Smith in the starting lineup with T.J. Carey is somewhat related to that because T.J. Carey is a player who's also played some safeties and would seem like more of a zone guy, where Sean Smith is very much a man coverage cornerback, boundary cornerback. Absolutely. One other team we want to talk about after a nice hot week one win is the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, Philadelphia fans were really psyched to see Carson Wentz throwing downfield. No talk of air yards this week. Uh, Nelson Aguilar is back from the dead. <laughs> How do you feel about the Eagles in week one? Well, as you know, I'm located uh, just a couple of, uh, an hour outside of Philadelphia here. So I, we have a lot of Eagles fans in the office. And everybody was shocked to see Aguilar have such a good game. He had eight catches for 86 yards and was uh, as targeted as anybody else on the Eagles, tied with Ertz and Sproles for the most targets on the team, more targets, more yards than Alshon Jeffrey, which surprised a lot of people. Now, they said, are the issues over? Well, we did chart him for one drop on his eight targets, but the six receptions were certainly more, more production than we're accustomed to seeing from him. And his receiver rating for the day was 149. So when they targeted him, they had a ton of success. Yeah, some of this, I think, is you just you, you don't know how teams are going to use guys after one game because often how teams use guys is based on how defenses play them. I thought part of what we saw there was a strong game from Rashad Freeland. Washington, uh, unlike what people expected, they expected Josh Norman to follow Jeffrey around the field. 
Instead, Norman and Breland basically stayed on sides, and both of them played really well, and the Eagles concentrated on Aguilar and Zach Ertz and, you know, throwing all the inside routes. They didn't go to the outside receivers very much. So I don't know if that's as much about, oh, Aguilar is going to be a big part of our offense. I think it's more about, you know, Brashad Breland played better than expected. We know Josh Norman is good. This is where the open guys were. Go where the open guys are. And the, the often maligned Doug Peterson, I thought, had just outstanding design and a great game plan. And, and that, that really stood out for me. For a coach that I was keeping my eye on, kind of seeing how the, how the schemes were looking, if he was matching up with his roster and really putting guys in the best position. And I, I was surprised in as nice a way as you could find with, with what the Eagles were doing offensively. Right. As you would expect, given that the NFC East teams played each other, all in week one, it really kind of created the stratification in our playoff odds. Philadelphia going up, the Giants and Washington going down. Also, of course, Dallas went up in part because we removed the Ezekiel Elliott suspension. But we now have Philadelphia winning the division 30% of the time, which is nice for them. Dallas 50%, the Giants 12, and Washington 8. Well, 9. You know, rounding errors and such. Right. Well, that jives with our... Uh overreactions that we could see with our eyeballs. I think those numbers about jive with what I would expect from the analytics at this point. Right. I mean, I think the biggest story from the playoff odds was people trying to figure out how much the Patriots were going to drop after losing to Kansas City. I know that they dropped more in ESPN's playoff odds than in ours, partly because I'm not sure if the ESPN... It's interesting. I can't tell if the ESPN football power index reacts to week one more than ours does or less. It seemed to react to the Patriots' loss more, but the Rams win less. That being said, we have, you know, New England is still our number two team in Super Bowl odds at 9.5%. And I think that that's really legitimate because, yeah, did they look as good as, they, as we thought they were going to be before the season? No. But did we think they were going to go undefeated? No. I mean, our chances of them going undefeated were under 1%. We always said... This is a very unlikely thing. They probably were going to lose at least two or three games. Kansas City is a pretty good team on their schedule. Very tough here's, matchup for them historically. Here's one of the losses. So it happened. But it's hard to believe that the Patriots are all of a sudden completely out of the playoff picture. One of the things I ran in this week's DVOA commentary is I went back as far as we have playoff odds for every week, uh, which is 2010. And the Patriots have the highest Super Bowl odds of any 0-1 team and the second-highest playoff odds of any 0-1 team, only surpassed by the 2012 Packers, which is sort of a weird situation. The Bears also won huge in Week 1 of 2012, but the NFC overall was so weak that the Packers' playoff odds were listed as really high even after a Week 1 loss because the chances of them winning a wild card were really high. Right. And what, what fascinated me from what I saw in your article was that the Seahawks were also on that list also in the top 10 amongst 0-1 teams in both playoff odds and Super Bowl odds, which the Patriots one I thought was pretty straightforward. It was, you know, where are they going to fall on that top 10 list? The Seahawks appearing on there is certainly food for thought as we think about who are the real contenders towards January and February. Well, again, this is a team that we had near the top of our projections. The Green Bay and Seattle were our top two projected teams in the NFC before the season, even if we didn't incorporate the Ezekiel Elliott suspension. So the fact that one of them lost to the other doesn't mean suddenly that they're the one that lost is out of the playoff race by any means. Seattle is still one of the top teams in the league. And I think, you know, they also have very strong playoff odds, very strong Super Bowl odds. What we take away from that game is not that Seattle's out of it, just that Green Bay's odds are stronger because right now Green Bay looks a little better. Absolutely. So now we talk about the playoff odds. I'd like to transition and act about what about number one pick odds? Did we see any big changes in terms of who had the number one pick based on our week one results? Well, of course, Jacksonville was one of our worst projected teams of the year. So uh, they're no longer in the top five for teams with number one pick odds. Indianapolis now is. We have the Jets at number one. Cleveland and Indy kind of tied it to San Francisco at four and Houston at five. And that brings us to our weekly tank watch feature, Let's talk about some of the quarterbacks that these teams are going to be going after. Who do you have for us this week? So the big games that happened last week were, were by two quarterbacks who don't have traditional NFL games. Baker Mayfield in Oklahoma 
had a huge game against Ohio State, and then Lamar Jackson put up about 500 yards in his game. So I got to thinking, can these guys project to be NFL players, and how can we use the statistics that we gather, the advanced statistics, to get a better picture of how they could fit? So one statistic that popped up is on throws downfield, what's your ability to complete passes? Because if you run a Pat Mahomes air raid scheme, you might have a lot of uh, underneath throws that are, you're going to have a higher completion percentage naturally because they're easier throws. However, if you start throwing the ball 10 or more yards downfield, now we start to see a little bit more about how accurate the quarterback really is. Sure, there's still some receiver effects, but we can start to hone in a little bit more on what the NFL skills are and if they really have the arm to make the throws. So I looked into our numbers from last year, and my question was, is Deshaun Watson or Pat Mahomes, are these guys fair comparisons for Baker Mayfield and or Lamar Jackson? Watson and Mahomes were the guys coming out last year who were the less traditional NFL-type quarterbacks. And what we saw on throws where they were more than 10 yards downfield, Watson threw 51% and Mahomes threw 46%. So that gives us a pretty good baseline. The 51%, 46%, right there, just below 50% range. When I looked at those numbers for Lamar Jackson, he completed only 44% of his passes more than 10 yards downfield last year. That's lower than Mahomes and much lower than Watson on that scale. Meanwhile, Baker Mayfield compares very favorably. He led the NCAA last year with a 57% completions on those throws, and he, trailed, and he was trailed by number two on the list, Sam Darnold, who's everybody's darling coming into the season for the number one pick. He was at 56%. So we're seeing uh, Mayfield overperform in terms of the ability to throw downfield whereas Mahomes was a little bit below average and Jackson is far below where these other guys are. And in fact, Mayfield has a higher completion percentage on throws more than 10 yards downfield than Jackson does overall. Interesting. I would guess most people, scouts who watched uh, Texas Tech might think that Mahomes' completion rate may have been you know, partially sort of affected by the quality of the receivers that he had. But what's interesting about those numbers is I think when you look at draft Twitter, Baker Mayfield is mostly written off and Lamar Jackson is going to be subject of a huge debate. Right. And it sounds like you think that at least this stat would indicate that Baker Mayfield also should be the subject of a big debate and should be taken more seriously as a possible NFL quarterback. Well, we're talking about guys who like to run around a little bit, and I think it's completely fair to be skeptical. And all I'm trying to do is let, let the statistics that I think project to the, the skills that I would look for to project to the NFL and see how these guys fit in. And this, was, right. this one in particular was one that really jumped out at me um, as a, a little bit of a scary thing for Lamar Jackson as far as his future as a quarterback goes and definitely makes me take a second look and say, ah, Baker Mayfield, I wonder if this kid, you know, is he big enough? Can he uh, make all the throws? and ask the questions that you'd ask about a true number one starting quarterback, and less so this kind of Johnny Manziel part two, run around all over the place Houdini. Um, maybe, he's, maybe he is Johnny Manziel, but maybe he's Russell Wilson. True, although as I will point out, every time Johnny Manziel comes up, we never had a chance to figure out if Johnny Manziel could adapt his style to the NFL because Johnny Manziel couldn't stop drinking when he wasn't in the middle of trying to adapt his style to the NFL. So. It would, Johnny Manziel would have made a much better test case if he had been a little cleaner off the field. Correct. And that is an oh. issue that Russell Wilson does not have. Yeah. Of course, a front office that's probably very interested in that subject is the Jacksonville Jaguars. And that brings us to the most important game of the week, which is, believe it or not, in the AFC South, between the Tennessee Titans and the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, in Jacksonville, and what's interesting here is because of Jacksonville's big week one win, the Titans week one loss, this is a division where we rarely expect a team to make it as a wild card. You have to win the division. So a 2-0 uh, start with a two-game lead over the team that we saw as the best in the division would be huge for Jacksonville. If they win this game, we give them 65% playoff odds. With a loss, it's 35%. The Titans are at 58% with a win, 28% with a loss. No other team in the league sees their playoff odds waiver by more than 25% with a win or loss this week. So what is your feeling here about Titans at 
Jaguars. The thing that I would like to talk about is the Jaguars and their performance last week. They made some changes specifically to their defense over the offseason that came through um, with really rave reviews after one week. They added Calais Campbell, and everybody knows he had four sacks. He had a sack on 10.5% of his pass rushes in the game. That is absolutely unheard of. Obviously an unsustainable number, um, especially as we charted three of his four sacks were unblocked. But the addition there was obviously the, the effects were felt immediately. They also added A.J. Boyd this year. That's the big, other than Calais Campbell, that's the big secondary addition is A.J. Boyd. And, I mean, Houston couldn't get anything going to outside receivers in this game at all. The other guy who I think really helped their defense is an offensive player that they added, and that's Leonard Fournette. Fournette had 100 yards, but he had 23 carries for 91 yards on zone runs between the tackles. And being able to create that one running back in the backfield between the tackles, power running game, getting downhill, 50 yards after contact on those 23 carries is obviously going to make a difference for your defense, especially when you're playing with a lead. And I don't think we should sleep on how important the addition of Fournette can be for their defense. And then, of course, also for Blake Bortles as he tries to resuscitate his career. Right. It impor it's important for the defense because Blake Bortles no longer hands the other team the ball on your side of the field. <laughs> Hand it to Fournette instead. I will say what was interesting about that game is Calais Campbell, we thought, okay, that'll really improve the Jacksonville run defense. Uh, this is only one week, of course. But Jacksonville was fourth against the pass in DVOA in week one, 24th against the run. So they did let Houston run on them a bit. And uh, of course, Tennessee's offense is built much more about uh, around the run than the pass. Now, so is Jacksonville's now. And Tennessee last year was 10th against the run, 27th against the pass. And in week one of this year against Oakland, 19th against the run, 29th against the pass. So it's interesting. Tennessee is a defense that's stronger against the run. Jacksonville, I'm not sure which they're stronger against, uh, run or pass, uh, but I will say that Delaney, well, I think Delaney Walker is going to be really important here because the quality of those outside cornerback for the Jaguars, you talk about Kashawn, Tashawn Gibson, he might be on Delaney Walker yeah. because you want to stay away from Jalen Ramsey and A.J. Bowie, although apparently they're a little bit injured and they're not practicing so far this week. Right, and I would anticipate seeing that matchup that you talked about, Tashawn Gibson being one of the top cover safeties and Delaney Walker obviously being a main receiving threat on the other side. I want to remind everybody, of course, Football Outsiders and Sports Info Solutions are partners on a lot of stuff. If you check out the premium part of Football Outsiders, you can find premium charting data for Sports Info Solutions, like cornerback cover stats and uh, broken tackles and drops and a lot of the other stuff we talked about on this uh, podcast for $30 for an annual subscription. You can also find the weekly fantasy projections for Sports Info Solutions, which are $25 for an annual subscription. This podcast, you can subscribe to it on iTunes, search for the Off the Charts podcast, and follow both companies on Twitter. Football Outsiders is FB Outsiders, and Sports Info Solutions is Sports Info underscore SIS, because both website names are too long to be Twitter handles. Absolutely. Please rate us, subscribe to us on iTunes, and check us out at Football Outsiders, at Sports Info SIS. With Aaron Schatz, I'm Matt Manicherian, and this is Off the Charts. <laughs>